Rosie next. Rosie, from the campaign against living miserably, um, and the, this particular um, charity, CAM, um, it's one that BPCA is keen to support. I know that you've got a, a, a partnership with Bayer, one of our, our manufacturing um, companies, um, and BPCA is keen to support that partnership. So um, we're going to hand over to you, Rosie. Thank you very much. Right, right. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I'm just going to present. Oh. My opening screen is just not where. Ah, there you go. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rosie from CALM, which is, stands for the Campaign Against Living Miserably. Um, and I'm a corporate fundraising officer. So I work with different corporates to spread the message of CALM um, and let make sure everyone kind of knows what CALM is, is there for them, basically. Um, so who is CALM? CALM is leading a movement against suicide. So we're a suicide prevention charity. Um, and why am I here today? So I'm here because we have a partnership with Bayer this year. And our kind of mission is to make sure as many people um, know about, you know, who work with Bayer know about what we do at Calm. And the reason that Calm exists is because there's a huge problem in the UK and across the world, but we deal with the UK. Um, in that around 6,500 people die by suicide every year. And that equates to 125 people per week. And 75% of all suicides in the UK are male, which means that suicide is the single biggest killer of men under, 20, under 45 in the UK. What we do at Calm is truly life-saving. So um, we run a free helpline and web chat from 5 p.m. to midnight, and that's every day of the week. And that is for um, people who have got worries and they want to talk about life's problems to those who are truly at the point of crisis and are at risk of taking their own life. I'm just going to, there you go. Um, so our helpline web chat is different to other helplines and web chats in that um, we are anonymous, we're confidential and we're non-judgmental. We don't use volunteers on our web chat and our helpline. We use highly trained paid staff. Um, we offer non-clinical support. So that's support that's different to that which you would get at your doctors. We're interventionalist. So if somebody is truly at the point of crisis and is about to take their own life, we will intervene and get blue light services to them. We're solution focused. So unfortunately um, for people who are experiencing suicidal ideation, uh, suicide feels like a solution to their problems. Um, and so we take that feeling of needing a solution and um, we, we offer alternative solutions. So we meet someone where they're at. Um, we're open to everybody. So we used to be just for men um, when we started. And that was because we were taking an at-risk approach. So men are most at risk of suicide and therefore we are going to, um, to support them first. But then as our resources have grown and demand for our services have grown, we have opened up to women and non-binary folks as well. So we really are there for everybody. In 2020, we answered over 144,000 calls and chats. And we directly prevented 556 suicides. So we get that number from um, people who, not just people who were um, it doesn't include people who were considering suicide, but, um, you know, had a conversation and decided it wasn't, it wasn't something they were going to do. This is people who are truly at the point of crisis on the phone, on the web chat and blue light services have got to them, or they've been talked down from a situation. Um, so that, that is where that number comes from. We are a campaign, so we're not just a um, web chat and phone line. We run 
two types of campaigns. So we run shocking campaigns like Project 84, which we ran in 2017. Um, and that is, uh, we took 84 statues and dressed them in clothes of real men who had died by suicide. Each statue represented a real man who had died by suicide. And that was because at the time, 84 men died by suicide per week. At the moment, it's 94. And that's in the UK. We put the statues on top of ITV Tower. And the uh, intention of the campaign was to get people talking about suicide, about the issue of suicide in the UK, something that we don't talk about enough. Um, and and it was to shock people into that conversation. Um, it was a really successful campaign. We got media coverage from around the world um, and it led to the first Minister for Suicide being appointed in government. So it was a really, really successful campaign, um, but it is one that is quite shocking. Then we also run uh, a campaign called The Best Man Project. And this is um, again, targeted at men. And it's to encourage them to speak about their best friend in a way that usually they would reserve for their wedding day if they were their best man. So um, it's basically the, the idea is that often um, when somebody is experiencing suicidal ideation, they feel alone or they feel like a burden. And this is to get people talking about how valued they are in each other's lives. Um, so that people know that they can open up to them um, and they don't need to hide their feelings. Um, so that was a really successful campaign. And then we have collective action. So this is really important at Calm. Um, we run something called Calm Collectives and they are for everyone. Uh, it doesn't matter your background, your age or your ability. It's all about getting together, doing what you love and feeling better for it. So we run cycling, running, football and art collectives. And these are basically groups where you do something you love and you are um, you're encouraged to open up about your feelings, your mental health in those spaces. They're spaces where you don't have to, to worry about talking about suicide. You don't have to worry about talking about your mental health. Um, and they're really, really valuable spaces that we run. Um, for people to feel like they can open up about how they're feeling. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the change changes that we're going through at the moment with coming out of lockdown. I know that this is something that many people will be finding quite difficult. Um, and so I, I wanted to give you some tips and tricks for what you could do in these situations. Um, if you're worried about keeping yourself safe and your loved ones safe, that is completely natural and normal. Um, what we would say in this situation is that you don't need to, um, you don't need to go as fast as the the government guidelines are going. So if you feel uncomfortable not wearing a mask inside because of, you know, you you feel like that's safer. Just because the rules say that you can do those things doesn't mean that you have to do them. You can you can keep yourself as safe as you feel you need to for as long as you feel like, like you need to. And you can slowly start reintroducing yourself to, you know, um, not always anti-backing your hands or not wearing a mask at the shops when those things um, when those things are removed from being necessary. So it's about taking it at your own pace. Um, that's kind of the, the message that we're trying to get people to, to, to understand is that just because the government guidelines are saying one thing doesn't mean that you have to go at that, that pace. Um, going back to your workplace. So this can be really difficult for some people. I know lots of you might have still been working through the pandemic, but for those of you that haven't, um, this is really difficult because it is, it's suddenly a lot of interaction that we might not be used to. Um, it's putting ourselves in, in contact with people that we've not been used to. Um, so it is difficult. I, we would definitely encourage talking to your manager. If you are the manager, then we really encourage you to be as flexible as you can be with your staff um, to allow them to maybe work hours uh, that mean they don't have to commute at the busiest times or um you know that they can wear a mask 
at work when when maybe they don't need to just things like that um really help so it's just about having that conversation with your employer about your feelings and how you're feeling nervous about returning to work and hopefully that will help start a dialogue where you can find a solution to those worries and we talk a lot about that what are in my team about the worry of another lockdown you know worrying that we can't do this again um you know, rather than feeling nervous about getting back out there, we're excited to get back out there. We're just scared that we're going to be put back under restrictions. Um, and we would say to this, we would definitely say, look, try and just worry about what is in your control. We can't predict the future and worrying about it isn't going to change it. Um, so it's it's just keeping in mind what's in your control and what isn't in your control. And worrying about another lockdown is something that just absolutely is not in our control. Um, and so all we can do is just follow the guidelines for now and just, you know, hope for the best, really. Um, we have something called CALMS 5 Cs. And these are really important. Um, and they're, they're really good to remember, especially at times like these. So connect. So connect is talking to somebody about your feelings and about your mental health. Um, you know, talk to friends, talk to colleagues, talk to family about just even one person, just about how you're feeling. And I think you'll find that actually your feelings aren't that different to lots of people's. Um, control. So this is like what I was saying before. It's about worrying about what's in your control rather than trying to worry about what isn't in your control. Sometimes it can really help to make a list of the things that you can control and just try and focus on those things. Um, it's really good for your mental health and it's really good for stopping like spiraling thoughts um, and things like that. Consistency, so we really recommend, especially at times like now, like now basically when everything's up in the air, finding some sort of routine um, and sticking to it so that you have a bit of consistency in your life. Um, it's really good, especially uh now when work is really just just different to we've ever experienced it before um finding some sort of consistency and routine is just so good for our mental health compassion so at calm we like to say don't be a dick to yourself and we like to to say that quite a lot um, and that's just because remembering that this is a really hard time and actually you know being being kind to yourself is such a, a such a a good thing for your mental health and then also having a bit of compassion for others knowing that they're they're going through quite a lot at the moment because these are really hard times and so it's just about taking things a little bit easier a little bit slower um and really having compassion for yourself and others and then finally one that's really important is to contact calm if you're feeling that you're worried about anything or you know or that you're at the point of crisis there really is no problem too small or too big for calm um you can call us on that number that's there um 0800 58 58 58 or you can go to our website um where there is the web chat function and that's if you you know if you're in a, a house share and you don't want people to hear you on the phone you can use the web chat function um, and the, it's the same people on both the, the helpline and the web chat. So you will get a highly trained professional um, at the end of both of those uh, services. Um, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, how COVID has impacted CALM and, uh, and what, what it is that we're, we're doing during COVID. So we've seen a, a dramatic increase in the need for our services. So our life saving services are needed more than ever at the moment. Um, during lockdown, our helpline had a conversation every 66 seconds. And these are around topics such as isolation, health worries, and financial stress in particular. Um, the, those things that we found that because of the pandemic have really, um, have really come to the forefront, but also people are talking about anxiety, relationship concerns, and of course, suicidal thoughts, which is something that we deal with um, at CALM all the time. Um, but even though our service demand has 
gone through the roof. We will continue to be there for people who need us. That's what we're here for. Um, we're not going away. Um, so we absolutely will be there for you if you need us. Um, but we really can't do it alone. Um, every life saving, potentially life saving call or chat costs just eight pounds for us to run. Um, so with the money that Bayer has donated and any any other money that people fundraise for Calm, it goes straight to our, our calls and web chats, um, which is amazing. It makes such a difference. Uh, if there's one thing I wanted you to take away from today, it's that Calm is here for you no matter what. Um, you know, it, it, there really is no problem too big or too small for Calm. Um, so if even if it's not you, if it's a loved one, what you could do is you could say, oh, I went to um, a conference today and there was a talk by Calm. They're there for people who have got uh, any worries, any life worries, or they're having suicidal thoughts. And that's all you need to say to someone for them to know that Calm exists. So then you could say they've got a helpline and web chat and it's on their website. And that's all you would need to say. You don't have to have a really big conversation with somebody you're worried about. Just letting them know that calm exists is enough. Um, but we are here for you as well. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, that's my uh, colleague's email. I forgot to change it. But um, you can email Rachel and she will forward it to me. <laughs> um, or you can get in touch with Bea and they will forward any emails to me if you need. Thank you so much. That's great, Rosie. Thank you. And it, it's such an important issue. And there may be some people thinking, oh, why have we got a session on suicide and mental health in a pest control session? But we, we work in a sector that have got lots of high risk people. So young men in particular and lots of lone workers. Um, uh, and both of these are, are high risk. Do you want to say something maybe about why young men in particular and and loan workers in general are high risk? Yeah, so we find that it's often um, to do with who is encouraged to speak up and who is encouraged to, um, to, to talk about how they're feeling. Um, you know, young men in particular are not encouraged to talk about their feelings in the same way that women and maybe non-binary folks are. Um, and I, I find that it's, or we find that, that that talking and opening up can be such a huge deterrent to suicide. Um, and, and so what we try and do at Calm is we try and encourage young men. We do campaigns to encourage young men to talk about their feelings, open up. Um, and I think with the lone working, you know, it is that, 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 lack of connection to others um and obviously access to means as well um unfortunately so so i think that that all those things together really do um add up to somebody being quite high risk super th thanks and certainly i mean we we surveyed our members a couple of times last year during the pandemic and um I mean, 40 percent of respondents were saying that they, what they were going through during the pandemic was affecting their mental health. And of course, yeah. um, we all have mental health. Yeah. <laughs> it just sometimes it's good and sometimes it's poor. Absolutely. Um, and we all use words like, oh, that's stressing me out or I'm worrying about that or that's keeping me awake at night which are all mental health issues. Yeah. It just, it's how we cope with them that's the issue. Absolutely. You said about coping mechanisms. Yeah, and I, I'd like to just touch on what you were saying about um, often we say things like, I'm, I'm exhausted or I'm, um, I can't sleep. Or, you know, we don't often, and men in particular, um, don't say the clinical words, they're less likely to say, I feel depressed. They're more likely to say, I feel shit. And they're, you know, they're less likely to say, oh, I'm having mood swings, more like, oh, I, you know, it, the, the words they use are less likely to be the clinical ones that you hear at the doctor. And so it's less likely to be associated with their mental health. And that's why at Calm, we try and like, we have um, 
posters that people can put in the bathrooms that say like feeling shit question mark and it's because we try and make sure people know that those feelings and that that language is to do with your mental health and um that when you're talking like that you you don't have to feel that way you can there is there is hope there is a way out um but I, and then your question was about coping mechanisms yeah um well that's why we have the the things like the five c's you know having consistency in your life is really helpful a routine is so good for, to hang things off to hang coping mechanisms off um we often do encourage people to um get you know get outside um which is really helpful um talking to people is one of the best uh coping mechanisms that you can have is to just be open even if it's to one person even if it's to somebody that you know has seen this talk today because then you know that they they will get it a little bit um it's it's just just talking to a friend even is so important um and then we do talk about writing down the things that you can control um and then and then just trying to keep your worries confined if you can to those things um because a lot of thing a lot of time worries can spiral when it's around things that you can't control and you have no uh, control over them um so yeah we we do tend to to talk about that and then uh, you know a great coping me mechanism is to call calm um to to have a professional to talk to um when you're feeling when you're feeling just crap is a really great time to call calm um even if it's just even if you can't figure out why you feel rubbish it's it's a it's a place to go it's where that's what that we're there for yeah, that, great thanks for that the and i mean clearly employers have got a responsibility for the health and safety and well-being of their employees so um what what can employers or line managers do to help the situation yeah i think um you know there are um there are things like mental health first age training that you can um get people within the organization to take part in so that there are places for so that there are people who are truly trained to help people who have who are struggling in the organization so that's something that i would definitely um encourage people to to look into doing um i think just i know my manager one thing that is great at calm is that we are they made it very clear from the beginning if you're struggling with your mental health please do come to me and i think being that clear that that you are a place that that you can go to um if somebody's struggling and it, and it might be that if they're struggling and you're like well i don't know what i would do if they did come to me all you need to do is signpost to calm so all you would have to do is say god that sounds really hard have you thought about calling calm that that's enough um, and so I think just making sure that you are, it's, it's a, a work culture where openness about talking about mental health openly is encouraged, um, is really important. Thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, and as you say, it's, it, it is that often get it on your team agenda, get it on your team meetings, um, yeah. get it into your one to ones. Yeah. There's been there's been this thing. There's been quite a lot of talk about when you're asking somebody, how are they doing? Yeah. And then following it up with that. You no, know, how are you really doing? Yeah. How effective has that been? I think that's really effective. I think um, I think that's all. We that's that's kind of all you can do. you can't force somebody to tell you how they're really doing but you can say how are you doing really and then we often encourage something called active listening which is it's sometimes when you're explaining it to adults it feels like you're teaching listening to adults but it's it's that it's that um 
being encouraging when someone is talking to you um and it's really listening and taking on what they're saying rather than thinking about what you're going to say next um is just so important and so we, we we you can't force someone to tell you how they're doing but you can make it clear that you're there for them if they are struggling and you can make it clear that you're a place that they can talk if they need to and if if the person if for example an employee you believe they have an issue or a problem but mm -hmm. they're not opening up to you they're not saying that they've got a problem um, they're, they're almost in denial about it. What, what then? Well, then you can you it's all, all you can do is create an atmosphere where if they want to, they can come forward. So then you can do things like get posters that are about calm and put them up so that they're seeing a helpline number. Um, you know, get get it in, into your one to ones where you say. Do I, you just ask, all you can do is ask to say you seem distant or you seem like you're struggling is everything okay and if they just say yeah everything's fine then all you can say is okay well I'm here for you if, if you need to talk and that that is literally all you can do um you can't force someone to tell tell you how they're feeling but you can make it clear that you're a space that is a safe space if they need to talk to somebody and you, you've got some great, I, I forget if you call them ambassadors, but you've, CAM has got some great ambassadors yeah. uh, that should chime, certainly, with, with young guys. So do you want to tell us about some of the people that you've got as ambassadors? Yeah, we've just got some new ones. Um, so I'm I'm very I'm not great with all the <laughs> all the sports people's names that we have. I know we've got Joe Marler, um, the rugby player, as one of our ambassadors. Um, and our kind of uh, strategy with getting ambassadors that are young men, that young men look up to, is that they basically will um, see that it's okay to talk about your mental health from these people who are notable. Um, and so we we do um, like cool videos with them. Um, we will just try, we'll do campaigns with them. We did one campaign with um, Chris Hughes from Love Island. And um, we what we did with him was we, we did a photo shoot with a bottle of water and uh, he said he was selling his tears um, in a bottle of water. And then people reported on it saying like, Chris Hughes from Love Island is selling his tears in as bottled water. And then we we released a, a, the next kind of picture in the series. That's that was him saying, "No, actually, I'm working with calm, and it's ridiculous to bottle up your emotions." And that got so much coverage. Um, and it was just it's just really important that we use our ambassadors to show young guys um, to to show young guys that it's okay to talk about your mental health. Yeah, absolutely, and there's there's a lot of these videos and other resources on the CAM website, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, great, um, Rosie. Thank you for that. Um, it's okay. it's an important issue. It's an issue that often doesn't get talked about, uh, and that's why BPCA is keen that we do include it. Um, you you had a couple of sessions at Pest Extra, your colleagues yeah. and you which was great. And once we're back to having in real life events, then I'm oh, sure- Oh, we can't wait. Yeah, absolutely. And it'll be great great to have you there and, and to be able to show everyone. But in the meantime, I'm sure our members um, will, will appreciate the resources that are available from CAM and appreciate the support that Bayer, our major manufacturing member, have, have provided to really bring this to, to our members' attention. So thank you, Rosie. That's Much appreciated. Great. Take care. Good to Bye. see you.